grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. My sermon text this week is uh, not from um, one of the Gospels or from the book of Acts, which have a nice uh, story. They actually um, easier to preach from because they got a storyline carries it along. But I'm preaching uh, this week um, from for the uh, epistle reading, the, uh, one of the, the letters of one of the apostles appointed to be read on this first Sunday after Easter. And today it's from uh, the first letter of Peter in chapter one, starting at verse three. And it goes like this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. Though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week was Easter. Personally, even though it was the oddest Easter of my life, and yours too, I expect, I felt joy. And even though there's just so much bad news in the world, not, not just in the world, close to home, but very close to home, and there's suffering, and painful loss all around, still somehow, I had joy. How? Because Easter is all about Jesus and what he did for the whole world when he rose from the grave. He has done something incredible and given us something that no bad news and no suffering or loss can ever take away. Because Jesus Christ is risen, Easter day is a day of hope, living hope. And so is every day which follows. But how are we actually doing today, one week later? In this present crisis, even the strongest Christians can feel the sad weight of the world, the weariness of separation from what's happy and familiar, the threat of loss, or the reality of loss, terrible losses, and their shoulders can start to slump. But that's what makes today's Bible reading, so helpful. I want to say so supernaturally helpful because it's a word that comes from God. It comes from heaven that gives lift amidst the letdowns of life. So as you heard, today's reading comes from the first letter of Peter. And I'm focusing where the apostle writes in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay, now, when we try to understand those words, that passage, immediately we're at a kind of disadvantage. How come? Because of two words in there, did you hear them? Born again. In our culture, those words have a connotation. They've got a meaning far removed from what the Bible means. So to get the victorious, uplifting hope that comes to us in this passage, we're going to have to first make an effort to find out what Peter meant. What was the ancient meaning, the real meaning, and not the modern, of born again? We really want to be talking about hope, but we're going to have to take this major uh, uh, off-ramp to talk about the meaning of born again. Some of you say, do we have to? <laughs> I'm not sure I have the stomach to hear a bunch of stuff about born again. Listen, I totally get that. What it's come to mean in our culture is not very appealing to me either. But on the other hand, what it really means is just so important. I wonder if you realize how much the new birth comes up explicitly in the New Testament. It's not a little afterthought. I think you'd be surprised how often it's there. John talks about it in his letters. Paul also in his letters. 
Peter does right here, as does James and Jesus himself. They all say, if you're the real goods as a Christian, you must have been born again. So it's important. What does it mean? Well, first, let's clear away what our culture thinks it means. It takes born again to mean what? A particular kind of conservative Christian. Either that or an emotional Christian or someone with a really uh, dramatic conversion story. The thing is, though, that all those meanings uh, are unbiblical. The new birth is not a particular flavor of Christian, nor only for a kind of person with a particular temperament. That may be but what it means today in the world, but it's not what Jesus meant, nor his apostles. When Jesus says, you must be born again, that's in John chapter 3, or Peter talks about the new birth, you know what it's also not? It's not a call to morality. That's sometimes assumed. But it's not that. It's not a call to morality or to some kind of religiosity. People often think this, but it's not true, not at all. Being moral or being very religious is something, it's something you could do on your own. But this is about the new birth. No one can give themselves birth. So insistence on a new birth is actually a direct challenge to moralism and to religiosity. You need something that your own efforts to be good or to be religious cannot do for you. What is it you need? First Peter 1 verse 3 says, He, God, has caused us to be born again to a living hope. We're told here that it's the hope, the living hope that God gives us, which has such an amazing effect on us that it's called a new birth. A hope which God gives us creates this transforming effect in us, an effect so profound in us that again and again it's described as a new birth. You say, wow, can, can hope do all that? Okay, well, I think, I think we're going to need to stop here, maybe go on another little tangent, and realize the dramatic effects that hope has. Hope means this, that human beings are absolutely shaped by their understanding of the future. When you, what you believe the future to be completely shapes how you're living now. That's powerful. The best illustration I've got to show you this is of two people. Uh, they're put in two rooms, same size rooms, same lighting, same humidity, same temperature, same everything. And they're given the same job. Screw part A onto part B over and over and over again for 10 hours a day. Same circumstances, same setting, same conditions. But here's the difference. You tell the person in this room over here that at the end of the year, they will have made $10,000. But you tell the person over here in the second room that at the end of the year, end of the year you will have made one billion dollars. <laughs> same job. But it's not the same job now, is it? Because how you do your job and how you, you process your job depends on what you believe the future is. The person in the first room will say to the person in the second room, this is so tedious. This is so boring. It's unbearable. I think I might quit. Don't you find it tedious and unbearable? And the person in the other room will say, uh, no, no. Not so bad, not so bad at all. How come? Identical circumstances are being processed in completely different ways because they have two different futures that they believe in. Well, you and I are affected similarly. We're controlled, I mean like how we live right now by our understanding of the ultimate future state. Now here's what it means, to quote First Peter, that we are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope, it means, our future has been entwined with the accomplished resurrection of Jesus. It's been entwined with his defeat 
of the death of death and his opening up of a whole new world in existence. And that means, because we're entwined with him, that not only Jesus, but us and the whole world are going to be raised up, redeemed. Jesus is going to redeem spirit and body. His body was raised. We will be redeemed, spirit and body. He's going to redeem reason and emotion, people and nature. In short, there is no part of reality for which there is not tremendous Easter hope. But many people don't believe this. I mean, not really. The Bible would say about them that they have not been born again into a living hope. No? Well, what do they believe? Well, that when you die, you rot. That's basically it. That life in this world is all the happiness anyone will ever get. The ultimate future? Many believe that someday the, the sun is going to die and all human civilization is going to be gone and nobody will remember anything anyone has ever done. And there it is. That's one very common way to imagine your future. But here's another. To believe in a new heaven and a new earth that the Creator God who raised Jesus from the dead will bring about. And to believe in a judgment day when every evil deed and injustice will be redressed, reversed. To believe that you are headed for a future of endless life and joy. Now those are two utterly different futures. And depending on which one you believe, you are going to handle your life including the hard times, including the dungeons, including your suffering, including your sense of purpose and what it's all about in two utterly different ways. The absence of hope in an ultimate future, it strips your life of meaning and purpose. Andrew Del Banco, who is he? He's a prophet from Columbia University. He's also an author of a book called The Real American Dream. And he wrote this. Hope is the way we overcome the lurking suspicion that all our getting and spending amounts to nothing more than fidgeting while we wait for death. Wow. Yeah. And when people don't have hope, but yet try to avoid that lurking suspicion Andrew DeVanco talks about, that lurking suspicion that it's all meaningless nevertheless seeps into their heart over time. It also seeps into our culture. I mean, have you been to an exhibition of modern art? Have you ever asked why so much of it is so bleak? No ultimate hope. Human beings are shaped now by their understanding of the future. You can imagine then that when you get a new hope, it's life transforming. That's why the Bible says that the resurrection of Christ has given us a living hope. What is this living hope, this future? First Peter 4 and 1, 4 and 5 says that it is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Undefiled, unfading, imperishable, wonderful. When a person actually comes to realize that this is true, these words are true, and when you get that hope, it's the new birth. Why? Because it changes your life completely. Because now you live, uh, how you live now is completely affected by what you believe that future to be. And such a wonderful future is going to affect how you live now. If you believe that future, it changes everything. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. It, it, it sounds good, but uh, pastor, I, I cannot see, I cannot see this great future the Bible's talking about. How can I be sure of and thus changed by a future I cannot see? Well, yeah, that is a real problem. What is? That God's promised future, and not just that, but indeed all the things of God, seem imperceptible and unreal to the natural man. And that, in turn, 
drives us to obsess over what we can see and sense, namely our, our privations, all the things we lack and our present sufferings. We obsess over these things and they just dominate us. And, they, and it moves us to hope and to fantasize and to pursue only those things we can physically grasp in this present world. Like what? Like, like lasting health. People obviously, they obsess about their health and about great wealth. People drive themselves for that and, and go into despair if it's not going to happen. Or great pleasure. Those are our hopes, our earthbound hopes. There might be others. Family, I suppose. Now, at some level, we probably realize that those desired things, health, wealth, pleasure, etc., we realize they can't last, even supposing we could get them. But what of it? To a person without a relationship with Jesus Christ, what else is there? This world, meaningless as it may be, contains all they hope for. The great hope held out in Scripture, like in our passage from 1 Peter, just seems too airy-fairy pie in the sky until you're born again. Listen. Listen carefully. The spiritual birth, which is the experience of the indwelling Holy Spirit, makes Christ's resurrection present and real to us. Not just an idea. It makes it real to us. And that awakens a living hope for God's promised future. 1 Peter 1 verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. This is the experience of those who have been born again. Then let's get back once more to that topic. Born again. Think about the metaphor of birth. What's birth? It's the entrance into a new life and the unfolding of the nature you were given at conception. For example, if you were born a bird, you're not going to develop into a human. A little baby sitting in a robin's nest, not going to happen. Because to be born means that you have a nature. It's called DNA. And the rest of your life is the unfolding of that DNA into becoming the being you actually have the nature to be. That means that when it says to become a Christian, you have to be born again. That's not about a dramatic experience, and it certainly doesn't mean turning over a new leaf and a moral reformation. No, no, no. It can't mean just that. It means you have a new nature implanted in you. Something is being put into the very roots of your heart, which is going to change you from the inside out, organically, for the rest of your life. What do I mean? Well, think about, think about this idea of life, that there, are, that there are orders of life. What's the difference, for example, between, uh, let's start at the bottom, between a rock and a plant? Well, a, a plant can sense its environment to some degree. It can sense heat and cold, light and darkness. But I'll level up, an animal can sense more of its environment. It can sense an object coming at it. It can uh, escape a predator in a way that a plant cannot. The plant can sense some of its environment, but the animal has a different nature and has the ability to sense more of reality and therefore act in the real world more effectively than a plant. Keep going. Think about a human being. Human beings have this thing called reason which means we can do deduction. We can figure out things that are happening. We can see certain things that are going to happen in a way that an animal can't. Not only that, human beings are another order of life because we perceive good and evil. You say, at least I know one person who would say, <laughs> my cat can perceive good and evil. Come on. We would never hold a cat or any animal responsible for, or say it is evil for, killing and eating weaker animals. But when we find a human being killing and eating weaker human beings, or when we see a group or a tribe or a nation just killing and destroying weaker nations, we hold them responsible. How come? Because we believe there is such a thing as injustice. 
We don't expect animals to be able to see it, but we expect humans to be able to see it. Every step up in the order of life can perceive more of reality and act effectively in that reality. So it is with the new birth. Yeah, when you show up, I don't know, a pig, show a pig a pearl or a murder, what does it do? It just goes on munching its corn because it can't sense the full reality of what it's looking at. We can, it can't. Similarly, without the new birth, you can look at the words God, holiness of God, grace of God, Jesus dying on the cross. And although you might even say, I, I believe those words. In reality, they might just be abstractions to you. You can't sense the full reality of them. They're not real to your heart. They're not electrifying. They're not galvanizing. They don't change your life. You don't act on the basis of them. For example, here's a person who says, um, I believe God is in control of everything, but I am worried. I'm anxious. I'm, I'm frightened, sick with fear about what is going to happen to me financially. And beside him is a person who says, because I believe God is in complete control, even though I do feel like I'm about to go off a cliff financially, I'm really okay. I, I have peace. What's the difference? They're looking at the same thing, God, but one senses the reality of him and one does not. The new birth means you're now able to sense the reality of things that before were nothing to you. You actually didn't see reality. The new birth is a new order of life in which you finally begin to sense the full reality of what is out there in the universe and you act in accordance with it. It's an incredibly powerful thing. It enables us to be lifted in all circumstances, like the ones that COVID-19 is dumping on our collective heads. The new birth enables us to be lifted in all circumstances by a living, eternal, and not merely earthly hope. If all you have is earthbound hope, then suffering makes the loss of your earthbound dreams unbearable. You've got nothing, but there's an alternative rooted in the reality of Christ's love and in his resurrection from the dead, God holds out to us the ultimate hope. What is it? It's a material world that's coming in which all suffering is past, it's gone, and every tear is wiped from our eyes. This future is a life-transforming, living hope. But it's nothing to you if you're not born again. You don't sense it. So then we want to know, how does the new birth actually happen? Well, it's not something you can make happen for yourself. Think about it. Do babies get born because they want to? Do babies say, I, I think I'll be born tomorrow? No. Babies participate in the birth, obviously. They cry and they wiggle and do all sorts of things. I've been to three births. They definitely participate in the birth but they are only born through the labor and suffering of someone else, someone else. So then understand what your relationship to Jesus really is. He actually says to his disciples, just before he is about to die in John chapter 16, he says, in a little while, you will see me no more. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her hour has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. Now, in the age of epidurals and modern medicine, the full impact of this might be a little muted. But in ancient times, no baby was ever born into the world except at the risk of the life of the mother. It was horribly, horribly painful. And every time a woman gave birth, her life was in the balance. When Jesus says, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her hour has come, you should know that everywhere in the Gospel of John, that word hour refers to the death of Jesus Christ. It's always used that way in John. So Jesus, in this metaphor, 
is identifying with a woman in labor. Jesus is identifying with a woman in labor. He's saying women give birth at the risk of their life through their pain and suffering, but I give you birth at the cost of my life. I die for you to give you life. Do you see this? It's not through its own efforts that a child is born. It's through the efforts of a mother. And it's not through your efforts that you are saved. Jesus says, it's through my labor. It's through my work. I brought you from darkness into light. I brought you from condemnation into forgiveness. And I gave you new life because I died. When you see that, and you realize, therefore, that salvation is a total gift, not a good work that you do. And you say, Father, you've accepted me, accepted me into your family because of what Jesus Christ has done. That is the beginning of the new birth. The beginning of the new birth is to see that it is a birth, to see that you're the baby and that he is the one who brought you in and who loves you. When that moves you to the depths, then heaven also will be a living, life-changing hope to you. Pastor Tim Kelly tells a story that I'd like to finish with. He said, There have not been many times in my life when I felt the peace that passes understanding, but there was one time for which I am very grateful, and it stemmed from this great Christian hope. It was just before my cancer surgery. My thyroid was about to be removed, and after that, I faced a treatment with radioactive iodine to destroy any residual cancerous thyroid tissue in my body. Of course, my whole family and I were shaken by it all and deeply anxious. On the morning of my surgery, after I said goodbye to my wife and sons, I was wheeled into a room to be prepped. And in the moments before they gave me the anesthetic, I prayed. To my surprise, I got a sudden, clear, new perspective on everything. It seemed to me that the universe was an enormous realm of joy, mirth, and high beauty. Of course it was. Didn't the triune God make it to be filled with his own boundless joy, wisdom, love, and delight? And within this great globe of glory, was only one little speck of darkness, our world, where there was temporarily pain and suffering. But it was only one speck, and soon that speck would fade away and everything would be light. And I thought, it doesn't really matter how this surgery goes. Everything will be all right. Me, my wife, my children, my church will all be all right. I went to sleep with a bright peace on my heart. God loves you and has opened heaven to you through Jesus. May you sleep tonight with a bright peace on your heart. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting. Amen.